I will use references constantly. Most of the time, it's just like, yeah, I have no idea who that is. I've never seen that movie. I don't know what oh that technology God. is. What's and a floppy like, disk? Remember when Mr. Beast blew up a car and everybody's like, oh, oh yeah, 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 we did that one. Yeah, which time? <laughs> yeah. Hi, Michael Carr here. On this Ask an Expert, we're focused on Stephen Barris as we ask him, how do we choose the right camera? Stephen is an Emmy award-winning producer and executive who has worked on productions such as Game of Thrones, Succession, and From the Earth to the Moon. He is also the creator of HBO's Camera Assessment Series, which evaluates cinema cameras for their technical abilities. Stephen has a wealth of knowledge to share, so I'm so excited we have him on this episode. Let's check out the conversation. All right, we got Stephen Barris here. Stephen, how you doing, man? Hey, buddy, I'm well. I'm well. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. You are currently uh, senior vice president of production operations at HBO, so your job is to know all the ins and outs of the technical operations that go into making a production. And one thing that you do actually on the regular mm -hmm. uh, is a camera assessment series for HBO. That's they're right. one of the I think they're the only network that really dumps a significant amount of budget into really assessing cameras. How do you go about picking the right camera for your production? That's probably the number one question that we get when we show people the, the HBO CAS, the camera assessment series. First of all, figure out what it is that you want to say visually or what rules does your world have to play by? Obviously, if it's a um, you know a sci-fi narrative, you're going to have some pretty specific rules, and you're going to have probably a, a pretty highly refined visual language that that show is going to work inside of. Think of like the Ridley Scott Alien film. You know, there was very little light, and the monster you never saw full. But there were all these rules that uh, he mm -hmm. would use to make sure that you know narratively and visually the story was working the way that he wanted to. Figure out those rules for yourself, right? Right? Am I allowed to move the camera? Am I allowed to, uh, you know, push in? Am I allowed to zoom? Am I allowed to, you know, you think about the modern Battlestar Galactica. So it's not that modern anymore, but it was one of the first sci-fi shows that zoomed inside the picture, right? I know it's not modern anymore because I worked on it. Right, so. that's exactly, yeah. yeah. If, we're, if, if we are using it as a reference, it's definitely yeah. not. I worked I, uh, on it early in my career, which means it's not modern anymore. Establish those rules for yourself. What am I allowed to do? And then back yourself into the different technologies, right? So, okay, I need to do something that is going to require me to manipulate the image an enormous amount. So, uh, you know, I'm going to need to push in. I'm going to need to reframe. I might need to do a bunch of visual effects to so that meet says the style. High resolution. Right? So you have to have bigger resolution then, right? That's yeah. when you're starting to say, okay, I need to shoot a 4K, 6K, 8K, uh, 12K in some cases plate because I'm gonna be manipulating that like crazy. The second sort of thing that you figure out in that space after resolution is, okay, well, what are my shooting conditions like? And that, I mean, from a lighting standpoint, am I going to be working in a stage? It's a three camera setup, like the Big Bang Theory. I'm gonna be shooting within about two stops, three stops. You can use a camera with significantly less dynamic range. And dynamic range is really, uh, you know, just the exploration of how high can we, uh, how, or how bright can we bright, photograph yeah. something to to how dark can we photograph something. Yeah. And that's measured in stops. An exceptional camera these days may have 16, 17, some would say 18 stops. Wow. That's probably maybe a bit of an exaggeration, but it's a huge, huge amount. Meaning that yeah. something that you captured that was you know eight stops under would also hold at something that was eight stops over. The modern Alexa 35 will capture you know, more than 10 stops over, um, which is pretty incredible. The modern uh, red V Raptor will capture down to almost no light and not only get exposure there, but also be very noise free. So that, you know, it's very expensive. If you want an Alexa 35, it's a $100,000 camera. If you want a V-Raptor, you know, it's a, it's a little less than that, but by the time you've rented 40. it and all the AKS and everything, it's, sure. it's, it's a huge investment. That being said, if you don't need, uh, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 stops of dynamic range, you could get a less expensive camera, less expensive camera package. And as long as you're willing to work within the limitations of that camera, then you can still produce a fabulous image. You could get a Black Magic, uh, you know, uh, digital cinema camera, which are you know very inexpensive. A more expensive camera is just giving you a bigger bullseye. 
Now, if you look at something like, uh, you know, a Black Magic, that you know that that bullseye is, is significantly smaller. If you look at something like a, a GoPro or something that's on the very low end, that bullseye is just a little bit bigger than the dart itself. And so mm-hmm. you have to be very precise. <laughs> that comes back to this: what's the you know frenetic visual language of our show? If we're doing a documentary, then that's probably fine because what matters is that we have an image that we can further the story with. Quality yeah. is sort of a little bit more variable when it comes to something like documentary filmmaking because yep. you're really telling a story with real life. And so your ability to make every image perfect is probably impossible. And not as imp- just not as important in the grand <laughs> Sometimes it, it also yeah. doesn't feel as true, right? This is great stuff, Steve. And I think you've been talking a lot about dynamic range and how that basically um, works along with the financials of, of camera choices. And I think you've kind of dove into a little bit of the aesthetic, which is basically what leads me to my next question, which is what if I'm a filmmaker that's like, I want to shoot a documentary yeah. and I've fallen in love with the look of Alexa. What would be the argument um, to say, well, you know, maybe consider something else. Yeah. Well, I think there's a there's a few things when you talk about specifically large format cameras. You have a really limited selection of lenses that cover that giant sensor. I mean, that sensor is the size of a tea saucer. You have to really think about the practicality of okay, how are you shooting this documentary? Is it all sit down interviews and you're bringing people in one at a time and you have plenty of time to focus and you have plenty of time to light? Then okay, well maybe you maybe you could do that. But I think when most people say I'm going out to shoot a documentary, they're, you know, the term sort of run and gun, right? They need a camera that has extraordinarily long battery life in many cases. That's nearly as important as anything. Because if you are changing batteries constantly, or God forbid you run out of batteries, uh, you may be missing, you know, the live action. In many cases, you're actually using a camera system that can support hot swapping of batteries. So yeah. you may have uh, something like a, uh, a Sony FX6 that has an onboard, uh, you know, little Sony battery on the back, and you also have, uh, you know, a 24 volt connected to a battery belt or to a vest or a bandolero or something like that. Those cameras will often also have two media card slots so yep. that you can record you can... on one and mm-hmm. then start recording on the other, swap that other one. So you can literally like not hit the stop button until the end of the day. Most of those cameras need to be able to record audio on board, at least for scratch, because you don't know, A, that you're always gonna have second system, but even if you do have second system, you don't know that that person is necessarily going to be on the action that you need. As long as you have the audio, you can tell the story. Oh yeah, and nowadays, you know how creative content creators are getting now with the animations Mm -hmm. and motion graphics and just all types of cool ways that, that they are able to tell a story. And then lastly, I think the biggest thing for documentary and like cinema cameras, be them large format or or otherwise, is the fact that a cinema camera is really meant to be used with an assistant. It's really meant to be used with someone else managing focus. With a crew, yeah. You know, because they're- And just the the, the size of the the peripherals, the accessories, it's just- you know, the interesting thing about cameras that are more focused on the documentary market, they almost always have uh, neutral density filters built into the camera. In the case of the new Sony FX9 and FX6, um, they have and variable NDs. Black Magic 6K yeah, Pro. Black and, Magic, yeah. yeah. They have variable NDs built right into the camera. So not only do you have the four little filters, but you've got an infinite filter. The, the coolest thing that the new Sony, the FX series does, is it will actually dynamically vary ND in order to maintain exposure. So oh, it doesn't what? iris That's up cool. and down. I didn't know that. Yeah, it doesn't have dynamic wow. irising. It has dynamic ND. And so you can say- Do you see it flip? Like You don't because it's it's two polarizers uh, moving in oh, front of each other. Wow. They actually oh, move vertically, but, uh, but yeah. So, you know, for documentary, that's really the way that I think about it. I think about it from the utility forward. So I'm gonna need a small camera that is as light as I can get it, that lasts as long on a single set of batteries as possible, and that probably has a way to do a hot swapping battery, um, that has a ton of record time, and that might mean I'm going to sacrifice my resolution or I'm going to sacrifice my bitrate, my my encoding uh, of the files um, and something that I can also hot swap those cards. I'm going to yeah. want a lens system that is single operator, that is, you know, operator uh, AC uh, in, in one. So that often means something that has either autofocus or has some type of manual focus that is is part of my handheld rig. 
and then a way to maintain exposure in all these crazy different environments, be it some kind of variable ND, some kind of something where, you know, I can get a, a, as good a chance at getting a good image under random circumstances as possible, you know? And then of course, good, good support, right? Like, do I have a good cage around the camera? Is it small? You know, is it, a, is it a nice package that I can put in and out of a case? So you may need a bag full of CF cards just to make sure that you can <laughs> yeah. get through, you know, and that's another consideration too. What kind of media does it use? Does it use Express card? Does it use, uh, you know, CF Express type B? Does it use SD cards? Does it use, you know, all and why that why would that different types of meat just, you know, for our viewers, why would that matter? Yeah, like an Express, uh, for instance, like the, um, you know, the red uh, Komodo and the, and the, um, and you know, in the V Raptor, so they shoot on uh, CF Express Type B. Uh, those cards are about three hundred dollars a terabyte, whereas an SD card are about thirty dollars per. You know, let's say sixty dollars a terabyte. I'd like to end with like sort of a fun kind of game. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I'm mm -hmm. gonna throw out a few different production scenarios. Okay. And I would like you to list like two or three cameras that could work for that production scenario and very quickly why. TV sitcom. TV sitcom, I would say the most important thing is something that you can gen lock and something that has a good program out because it's probably okay. going to a switcher and it's probably going to be a uh, line cut uh, live. That'll go uh -huh. to the editors, but they do a line cut live. So in that case, remote shading, uh, being able to uh -huh. color correct the camera remotely, uh, you know, big lens control. Um, mm -hmm. and uh, and being able to do a nice, clean, uh, high-quality, full-quality line out of the camera. High-end narrative television show. Right now, in high-end narrative, we're really looking at, at three cameras. It's V-Raptor, it's Alexa of some flavor, and it's Venice uh, 2. And, you know, that's really, you know, kind of split by this large format sensor world and super 35 centimeter sensor world. Most of these manufacturers now are building a camera that does uh, one or the other, right? Aerie has a 35 and a large format. Sony can kind of mirror the the Venice and there's this new intermediate 6K camera that's sort of more focused. At, and then the, the V-Raptor has both, the VV and the, and the 35. So it's that, and then it's lensing. High-end television is all about lensing. Okay, low budget document. Low budget documentary, I would say the, the most important thing is to get uh, probably the best camera you can afford to buy because okay. low budget documentary is often a documentary of opportunity, meaning that mm. it's going to go on for years in some cases. And so the ability to purchase something so that you know you have it, it's in stock, it's in the back of your car, it's wherever, when you need it, I think it's the most important thing is to have the camera all the time. And honestly, nowadays, I would almost almost say if you get some accessories for an iPhone 15 and you're shooting ProRes directly to an SD card or something off of that new iPhone in a the Black Magic, Magic camera app which is free you are making images that are better than you know many many documentarians have you know ever had okay last one lower budget short film mm -hmm. Stud like student film yep. let's say I would say, you know, I see, and it used to be more prevalent, but I would see a lot of student filmmakers say, you know, I'm shooting on film. That's, I've wanted to do it really badly. I'm gonna shoot 35. And what I've always said is, if you have an infinite number of days on set and an infinite number of days in editorial, you can make the perfect film. <laughs> Nobody cares what it was shot on. You know, yeah. like the yeah. idea of spending more time on set, buying yourself more days by not overspending in your gear uh, mm -hmm. is huge. You know, if you yeah. can use more practical lighting, if you can use a camera that is a little bit less expensive, but you really understand how to hit its bullseye, those mm -hmm. things make a huge difference. No one cares. No one can tell. <laughs> You know, it's just like it's not, you know, and we can do the fact so that you much got, you know, now, you know, 20% more coverage is, is huge, is way bigger than just, yeah. Yeah. And my, as you know, like as an editor, like having more things to be able to cut more aggressively because you can go to B angles because you can go to stuff. It just makes a better show. Steve, before we go, I want to give you a quick shout out. So you have a course, online course that people can check out. That's right. Through Full Sail, yep. uh, DC3, their online platform. Yep. And it's called The Art of Cinematography, Mastering Visual Language. And if you want to know everything you possibly need to know about choosing cameras, 
you know, how to develop a visual language for your production, this is the course you want to check out. Steven has that available online through Full Sail DC3. Check it out. Yeah, and they've just, you know, they've just revamped the, the course structure. So the courses are $550 for a six-week course. Part of that is interacting with me. It's it's watching, geez, almost 10 hours of, uh, of content with myself, with the uh, DP from The Mandalorian, Dave Klein, Ian Vertivec, colorist from uh, Light Iron here in Los Angeles, a very old friend of mine who's colored everything David Fincher has ever done and and, and all that sort of stuff. And it's really, really in-depth look at not just like how to choose a camera, but why we do the kind of tests that we do and how we test things to really compare and contrast and really understand image making at a much, much deeper uh, level, not just technical, but but also artistic and FullCellDC3.com. Steve, I think we have one more thing we wanted to mention, right? Yeah. For everybody. Shameless plugging. Yeah. So Mike and I have known each other for, you know, more than 20 years now. You know, we've always been interested in, uh, you know, the sort of gear side of the business, be it post or production. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, we have sort of seen a, a hole in the market, if you will, where the expertise that we sort of bring to post and to, and to cameras can kind of come together to offer a little bit more holistic experience. So we're launching a new... Uh, uh, camera specific uh, rental boutique uh, early next year. We call it Cinebear, uh, which yep. is uh, you know which is a sort of fun thing because it it really is uh, you know about image making adventuring. It's the gear for uh, cinematic adventures, and uh, yeah, we'll have a full set of uh, cameras, AKS lenses, everything you could want. Plus, we're going to be the home of a lot of the what we like to call garage manufacturers or small manufacturers working here in LA to make little widgets and chachkis that don't necessarily have a, a big distribution channel. It's cinebear.la and all the gear is up there and you can check it out. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, hopefully uh, see you uh, in the shop to, to chat cameras or, or whatever else soon. This was fantastic, Stephen. Thank you for taking the time. I learned a lot myself. So I know a lot of people out there are going to learn a ton. Thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate it, buddy. All right, buddy. We'll, uh, we'll see you soon. 